Hello everyone, I'm Nick Stanoshek, author of The Vedra Saga, and today I will be interviewing Zach S, also known as Zach Smith or Zach Sabbath. He is the person behind such books as A Red and Pleasant Land, Frostbitten and Mutilated, he's the editor of Fame to the Earth, he has rewritten Death, Frost, Doom, and some of his even more famous things are Bornheim, The City Guide, and Maze of the Blue Medusa, which he also worked with Patrick Stewart on, and he also worked with him on Fades of the Earth, as mentioned before. So without further ado, here's Zach. I can hear you. How you doing? You're doing good. How about yourself? I'm terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. All right. Um, so I just kind of want to, I'm just, just going to start off, kind of let people kind of know a little bit about you, uh, about your art, about your writing, all these different kinds of things, um, history of projects you've worked on, because one of the things I've found out is Sometimes people know your work, but don't realize who you are and uh, all, all the things that you've done. And then we can go into some of the things where, uh, where trolls have attacked you and uh, let you give us the facts of that after we do kind of the introductory thing, if that works out for you. And whatever works, I don't need to be prepped. I'll just tell you, you know, I'll just answer whatever you got, so. All right. So um, if you'd like to go ahead and start off, uh, talk about how you first got into role playing games, into art and and uh, creating your own role playing games and creating art. Um, well, I first got into role playing games because I was uh, in elementary school and, uh, you know, the kids were passing around, you know, all things, you know, their comic books or, you know, in their games and whatever. Um, I think the first game I actually played was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game where I played a prairie dog mechanic. Um, and it was all random. So neither of those things were on purpose. I was just like, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm a prairie dog mechanic. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I really fell in love with the, uh, I feel like this is a thing that, I don't know how, you know, people always say that things like that are inaccessible, you know, when you get like just like this elaborate mythology, backstory rules. But I, as a kid, I love things like that. You know, I love the like DC and Marvel encyclopedias, a bunch of characters I never heard of, you know. Um, and so I was just really interested in like anything that seemed like esoteric, but it was still like something that was kind of for kids um, or, you know, maybe for just a little older teenagers. So I got into that and then uh, completely stopped after I got to like high school and college. Um, and uh, I, I became an, like, I, I was always interested in drawing and I wanted to do comics when I was a kid. And then I eventually in high school, the public schools there in DC were all full of these programs to keep us from selling drugs um, where I, you know, so uh, there was the school that you would, you know, the, they were like the public school system was like if you were smart you would go to the math and science school and if you were creative you'd go to the the art magnet school uh, and they both were regular schools but they had this little part you know magnet in it and uh and i was and i couldn't decide which but i was like i visited the art school and i just sort of ended up there being like this is really cool so i ended up just like on that path uh went to art school and i was like oh i could do whatever um and i you know did all I went to college, had a bunch of, I got very lucky out of art school, basically. Um, like just kind of hit the jackpot in terms of, you know, the roulette wheel of which of the, the, the students will end up having shows. And, you know, like there were like in my grad school, there were like 20 people in painting per year. And of those like three or four immediately had big careers. The, the biggest person from my grad school year was the guy who did Obama's portrait you know oh, yeah? like Faith, Leaves, Kehinde, Wiley. Um, he was probably like the jackpot of jack 
Potts, um, he came out and, um, but it was me and him and like three or four other people just immediately started showing and got lucky. Um, so after like working through grad school and working through college and, you know, working in my year off, like I was like, oh, I don't have to work like a normal person anymore. Um, and then I got eventually met my girlfriend and we hung out and she was very sick um, and couldn't go out a lot. And so we started like doing things like, what can you do at home? You know? And so, uh, you know, to get people to come over and we didn't really play poker. So we started playing D and D again, you know, and I was like, do you know about D and D? She's like, not really. And then we started and it all kind of, you know, I was like, started blogging about it. I was like, yeah, we're porn actors and played D and everybody was like, that's weird. Um, in the beginning it was, I mean, I think now because everyone, there's only fans and there's just been 10 years of normalization of, of sex work between now and 2009. But at the time it was like, wait, okay, there's girls playing D and D that's weird um, yeah. at all. I don't believe you. And then they're porn, they're in porn and some of them are strippers and like, no, like this is, and you know, that was like the first hill, uh, that you had to kind of overcome and be like, no, you know, you're, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of, and then, you know, I started doing blogging and then people liked the content. And then after a while, you know, I was like, why don't I, you know, I could make a book or something like that. Um, and uh, started doing stuff like that. So, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, that answered like about 10 of my questions. <laughs> so that was really good. Um, do you think it was your, your school's connection that helped you guys where you were able to have your stuff in museums and art shows right away or oh, undeniably um the art world is not a meritocracy uh it's not like basketball where like if you're better than everyone else you get it um the the fine art world is just pure like you know it's just pure luck and uh and you know the, they have these sort of established channels, you know, Columbia, Yale, like I, I went to college for free because I went to Cooper Union, um, which was free at the time. Uh, it's like a small school, long story, but it was free. And so I was ready. I could take on a big loan by the time I got out because I had paid no money. I'd actually made money going to college because my parents had had a crappy divorce and they argued with each other and they both signed paperwork saying that they had to pay for a third of my college. And that's, of course, the pen expected parental contribution is way more than any parents actually contribute, but they were both going to sue each other if they didn't, you know, so I ended up actually like, I just would like, thank you, mom, dad. Okay. Like, you know, they were, they were like, fuck, we both have to, they were, they kind of like bamboozled each other into like ending up. So I made like, you know, a hundred dollars a semester off of going to college. Um, and so, and then I worked all the way through it. Uh, I was a tutor and a teacher. And so I was like, when I went to grad school, I also worked all the way through grad school. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if I hadn't gone to Yale, I wouldn't have met the same people. Like, it's just totally a, a nepotistic system. You know, like that's why people go to grad school. They don't go because they're like, oh, there's things I haven't learned about painting yet. It's, it, you know, it's like the people who teach there are people who are already in museums or connections. And so, you know, you, you do it because you're like, yeah, I wanna have a career in this field and that's where you go. Um, people who aren't from that system, like you have, it's all, basically it's like who you know, you know? So it's, yeah. All right. Well, good. So you said you started just writing stuff on the blog. People liked it. And so you said, Hey, I can go ahead and write a book. So how did you start actually getting your stuff published then? Um, well, I basically at one, like during the early controversies about the blog, like, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of grumpy at that time. It was mostly grumpy, grumpy OSR or like pre OSR, like people who had been on the internet since it was invented, essentially um, complaining about D and D um, those people were like, who are me and a bunch of other, all the bloggers around 2009, these were kind of new people to them. They had been on the forums, they had been on Usenet or whatever, and they had been putting their potion formulas or whatever forever. And they didn't like these new bloggers who were like, or at least, you know, they would sometimes find, reasons to complain about, you know, uh, new people who were on and they were like, there was a, a certain group that were like, oh, you know, this whole D and D with porn stars thing is just like stupid or whatever they would argue. And, uh, James Raggi, who was doing Lamentations or about to begin it, wrote this like long defense of me on the thing. He was like, like they're playing the same game as you, you know, like he's, 
you know, like they were, you know, somebody had was complaining that I gave all this money to Food Not Bombs, which is an anarchist organization, but it was also like a charity. And I was, and they were like, how is that a bad thing? You know, like he was, he was, he, I was like, he's not only like making, he's serious about making games, you know, in a way that a lot of people were, you know, it, he just, he took the time out of his day to like do content. Um, but also like, he's a stand up person. Like he's actually standing up for somebody in the community who's not himself. Um, and I was like, that's cool. And then when I, we did our first showed up, people would ask us, oh, can we do this? And they weren't really offering good deals or good ideas. They were just like, hey, can we get a piece of you? And I was like, eh, you know, you don't like, that's not a lot of money. Like that's not worth the effort or that's not a product I want to be part of, you know? And, and then I was, but I was like, James is doing cool stuff. And I was like, well, do you want to put something out? And he was like, yeah. And immediately his thing was not, hey, how do we brand this to sell it? It was like, well, what do we, what does not exist that I really wish existed? Like, what's a useful thing that I've never thought is useful? And he's like, I've never seen a good city supplement. Like that was his take, you know? And I was like, yeah, I mean, there's a city in the game. And so he was immediately focused and he always has been on genuinely, how does this work at a table? Um, which kind of put him, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, it was just like, I was like, yeah, this guy has got, good things going on at that time it was he was he was doing something special you know and so I was like all right well let's make a deal and uh and so I took a month or two off uh and you know cult like collated content from the blog uh in and then added things I thought they needed and he was like put in a few adventures and please draw something and I was like oh right um and so because I was like maybe get someone else to do the art it seemed hard <laughs> but I was like fine I'll do it um so I took an, like two, a month off to write it and a month off to draw stuff. And then we argued a lot about the graphic design because I was like, cram in as much pup stuff as possible. We only have 64 pages. That was my whole thought process. Only 64 pages. Let's get the maximum. Because I had, after I'd written it, I've just been looking at all these other city supplements that people had put out. And I don't know about you, but you hear about a thing for years. You're like, oh, the, the Lankmar supplement or Tolis or whatever. And you're like, oh, I, I got to check that out. And then you get it and you get the a vibe in like four or five pages. And then it just seems like it's maybe 10 or 15 pages between new ideas. You know, like it's, right. it just seems like a lot of like, they dress the way you'd expect people to dress in medieval France, but they take three paragraphs to say it. And it's like, it's a combination of people being paid by the word and not having the internet in the early. So there wasn't a lot of things that you could Google and not having general cultural literacy that comes with that. Like, you know, if I say Eastern European medieval, you might not know what I'm talking about, but you Google it, you know, you did it. So, it, it, right. and there was just like a lot of reasons why that, that, that style, the normal style of writing supplements was something that we could, we could go beyond, you know, like just because part of it was, was us, but part of it was just the, you know, they were done in an earlier era and the new ones hadn't caught up, you know, like that was during the end of the D20 glut, the beginning of 4E and people still hadn't really adapted. They hadn't like, there had been, there were people who were in the indie scene, like the, the story game scene who were doing completely different formats for games, of course, mm -hmm. but nobody who was doing sort of traditional and d and ish role-playing games had looked at the whole format of a book and gone, hey, we can just do things totally different than people did them up until now. Like no harm, no foul. And so uh, that's what we did. We we're just like, let's reformat the whole thing. Uh, and that was fun, like as an artist to just sort of design the project from the ground up. And uh, yeah, that was the first thing. All right. Um, and then it was one success after another. You got all these awards for all these books. And uh, I mean, how many awards have you won for your books that you've put out now? Uh, for the game stuff? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I have a shelf in the kitchen um, so I can kind of count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So at least 15. There are a few that don't have a physical trophy or anything. So I don't know how many, but like, and there's like littler things and bigger things, but something like that. Uh, so so I, I wonder, because to me, it seemed like some of your books are not even necessarily the Lamentations book, like, uh, 
um, Maze of the Blue Medusa. It was a whole new way of setting out a mega dungeon and making it so easy for the referee or dungeon master. How did you come up with this? Okay, how am I going to make this super easy for the person using it? Because it seems like so many books, especially now in the modern way, you're having to flip so much and you kind of came up with this less flipping type of method. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I thought like the first thing is like I was running games, you know, and I was like, I can't. And, you know, usually I made up my own stuff and I was like, I can't imagine buying. I remember one of the like when I was in I wasn't even playing, but just like when I was in school or something like I picked up Dragon Mountain and I was like, I can't fucking imagine using this. Like it's got a map in this book and it's got numbers here and we have no idea what the, what's in each room until you go to this other book over here. But then if you want to know what you're, what you can smell from room 75 from room 64, you have to flip back. And it's like, I can't imagine, like, honestly, like I can't imagine GMing at a reasonable speed using one of these things. So it's like, on the one hand, you either have to improvise everything and then you're losing out on the advantages of even making these books, you know, like something that's thought out on that level, or you're just like, hold on every 10 seconds. And so my first thing was like, oh, this is like art school. This is a design challenge, you know? Um, and so my, my take was just like, well, the first thing I did is I made the painting and I didn't even know exactly what our format was going to be for graphic design, but I knew that that was the thing. And then I was like, okay, I don't want to make something that's harder to use than a regular thing. So why is this painting, why, why is the painting matter? And I was like, okay, well, the painting has these little images. And once you've read through it once, or, you know, you'll see that, oh, that image reminds me of that that's that room, you know? So like, it's not just useless indulgence. Like you can actually be like, oh, we're getting close to the room where the demon is and stuff like that. And so I was like, let's design it so that the fact that I made a painting first uh, helps, you know, rather than is just sort of an extra, you know, right. um, and then the graphic designers who worked on it, like, there was a lot of back and forth with them. And, you know, like they were, they, they worked hard. Um, uh, in all of these cases, I'm not the final graphic designer. I just tell the mm -hmm. graphic designer what to do and set some hoops that, you know, um, but it's just sort of setting a standard where it's like, okay, what do, when you're done doing your graphic design, what do I need to know is there? Like, I wanna, I wanna have a little summary of what's on every little, every room. You know, like I, I guess, you know, it was a combination of wanting to doing something just fun that was creative to do, but then also like having the experience of having run these games and being like, let's not put out something that's worse than, than, than the things I don't like. You know, like uh, I have to, Cause I got to run it, you know, like you can't put out right. the maze of the blue Medusa. And then, you know, it's the, it, you know, indicate is like, Hey, come to, come to the indicate and run in maze of the blue Medusa. Like you have to do it. And your players, my friends live in my house, you know, they're like, Hey, you know, you have this dungeon. Let's, you know, you can't just be like, no. So, <laughs> you know, uh, and I honestly think like, this is a problem is like a lot of the, this industry, people don't leave. Right. So mm -hmm. Ed Greenwood like puts out his like his Forgotten Realms book and he does not play it, you know, like he's Ed Greenwood. He's been here forever. He doesn't, you know, he's not in the trend. Like, you know, Monty Cook is not sitting down being like, shit, I better. I mean, he probably does run his stuff to some degree, but he's not like, he's not in that place where he's constantly has to. It, it, when he designs something, he knows it's a product. It's only, right. it, it can only be a product. Now he can play it if he wants, but like when I make something, I don't have time to make something that I'm not going to play. I'm not a full-time designer. I never was, you know? So if I'm making something, I kind of want that to be GM prep for me, mm -hmm. you know, like all that prep time you sit around filling in the hex, hex map. Like I don't want that to be wasted. So I'm making something that I know I'm going to play because I'm never going to spend a month prepping ever again. So I want it to be really prepped. Um, so yeah, you know, like it, it, that motivation, I think helps. And I think it helps a lot of people who are now making stuff is that they know that they're going to play it, you know, right. and, uh, and they have less money than those designers and they're not full time like the previous generation, but they're making kind of more creative and useful things a lot because those are the things they got to play, you know? Right. Yeah. So many, so many games this day seem to be made by committee and by people who aren't necessarily actually refereeing or anything. And the book is just not laid out that way. And I remember 
when I first saw Maze of the Blue Medusa, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a totally different layout and this makes sense. Oh my gosh, this is obviously somebody who referees books. And that, that, was, that was a big pull in to me to start checking out your other works and to check out Lamentations and that. Um, speaking of your books, which of yours is your favorite? And I know that's like choosing a favorite child for a parent, but which of yours um, stands out the most to you and why? I, I think it changed. I think they have, they win different prizes, you know, like the one I use mm -hmm. the most is Vornheim just because it has things that just keep coming up, you know, just generally, it's just generally useful. Uh, a lot of people who don't even, they don't run that setting or they don't even, not even running a city. They just use it. Like almost every OSR book now has an, I search the body table. Right. Um, and that name of that table was in Vornheim because we were trying to do the tables in alphabetical order and get it in the right place and it was like called like what's on the body or you know looting the corpse table and and we we're like it's it's better if this is here and so I was like why don't we call it I search the bot like so that you know there's a bunch of stuff in Vornheim that's just sort of generally useful um in terms of writing Red and Pleasant Land is a book that like I pick it up and I go oh yeah look I wrote that I forgot you know, like uh you know I'm, and i feel like in terms of the the art in that book was it was probably required the most invention in the rpg sense of like invent a creature or a place and then create art that tells you w what it is or what it looks like so in terms of like the kind of creativity that like uh that is very specific to world building and RPGs and to games. It kind of does that the most of the ones I made, but then Blue Medusa like, just has that variety, you know, which I, I like just like all the different kinds of making pictures. So I don't know, different days, I have different things. Gotcha. Um, what is your favorite <laughs> RPG book that's not by you? Um, I really like the Realms of Chaos books by uh, the warhammer ones uh mm -hmm. the first edition like i i don't think i just, i like whenever i go to make a new one i go like is it as good as that and you know and then i'm like while i'm making it i'm like maybe and then it comes out and i'm like maybe and then after a couple months i'm like no i gotta do another one because it's not as good you know like they're big and they're beautiful and they had such a breathtaking number of artists who were all great and then they were just introducing content that was like all the whole chaos thing really began there you know like there was kind of references to that in the in warhammer 1e but they really fleshed it out like all the four armies and all that and then just the writing some of the writing was just like a horror short story but but in terms of like the design right like the, the mutation tables and just like it just did it just it feels like a like a magical book from another planet you know and it and it doesn't let you down like you flip through and you read things and it's like it, it's in it's all in that space so i'm always trying to make the next uh realms of chaos uh and i never have succeeded uh, ever i feel like demon city when it comes out might be close in its um but i guess i always feel like that like oh maybe i did it this time you know um but yeah so but yeah, those are the ones that take my breath away. All right. Well, <coughs> you, um, since your your time uh, leaving Lamentations, you've been doing Cube World on your blog, and it has connected like all of your books you were doing, your books that had gotten canceled. Were they always planned to be part of this Cube World, or did Cube World come along later to connect all of these together, or how did that come about? I mean, that I basically everything I put out is just my campaign like right. all of it you know like red and pleasant land is just what hungary is like in this and so early on and you can it's somewhere in the blog 2010 or 11 i was like oh yeah the world is shaped like a cube you know and that cube world was never the name i just said it was shaped like a cube because why not um and uh and then after a while i got to the idea that it was you know in in D, &D there are planes and i was like oh the planes are the planes of the cube like so you only know the right. So I, I just sort of like all the ideas that I have go in different places so that 
I can have like one long campaign, which everybody is in and you can sail from one world to the other. So everything was always, so some of the stuff in the, in the cube world PDFs are from like day two of me running a, a game as an adult. And some of them are from the week before, or, you know, maybe a few months before. Uh, but yeah, it's all one thing. And it always kind of was. And the, the thing about me working at Lamentations was that I was always trying to, as, as Lamentations got on, like went on, it has become more and more, it's not D and D it's the 17th century. It's there's gunpowder, like, you know, there's no dwarves, there's no elves. And that's like, not, what I was doing, like, you know, I'm like, so you can watch the, like, that's why uh, Maze of the Blue Medusa didn't come out from LOTFP is because by then James had decided, like, we're branding hard, you know, where's Vornheim, there's dwarves and shit. Um, and uh, so you can, like, so yeah, I mean, my stuff is more d d you know, like, I, I want to be able to do like any fantasy idea I have has a place somewhere on the earth. And so, I was, you know, I've been making maps forever and hex maps and changing them and fixing them up and, you know, elaborating some things. So yeah, cube world is just the rest of the world. To me, it's all, you know, you can go, you can get on a boat in Vornheim, you can sail to like Voivodja to Red and Pleasant Land, you can go back north of Vornheim and hit Death Frost Mountain. And then if you keep heading north, you hit Frostbitten and Mutilated. And then if you, you know, uh, you go to the middle of the islands, you end up in Maze of the Blue Medusa. And also like any other, the other books that I liked, you know, they're also there, you know, so it's kind of a mishmash world. And that way, I don't know, for me, it's just, I feel like a lot of times the, the fiction that we like is actually much more broad involves a lot more things than we think because they have such a powerful style that you think oh you know game of thrones that's very low fantasy we're just like well they got zombies they got dragons they got witches they got it's actually hard to think of a monster that isn't in there so you got giants they got dwarfs you know like but because there's a powerful style overlay it feels a certain way and so right. i was just like well you know just to me there's a way to get it all in you know so yeah right um, so you mentioned that in your world, the books that you liked were also there. So like other Lamentations books that other authors had written? Yeah, I mean, uh, back when, uh, before he became a massive douchebag, uh, David McGrogan's no, uh, Yoon Swin was over there where Tibet should be, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I have like once, you know, oh, I was always open to the idea that, um, if I, you know, if, if the players wanted to play something and it was D&D &D could somehow fit it in, you know. Right. I had this one idea that if you went over the edge of the cube, the system would change. So, oh, wow. you know, <laughs> if you a dragon or a different edition, your spell, and you have to convert your character, you know, like, it's like, <laughs> oh, the world is different, you know, like, and, and I kind of like that idea. And I, I'm thinking about like maybe expanding it, like certain continents are high magic or low magic. Um, right. But I haven't really pushed the envelope on it. All uh, right. That kind of reminds me of like the um, Forgotten Realms novels. Like when there was a new edition out, they had to change the way everything worked all of a sudden, you know? <laughs> Time jumps in that. I um, it. Yeah. Um, so Satire Press was created specifically for you to publish maze how did that come up about well basically the guy who uh started it ken bauman was like a child tv star um and he created a self-publishing imprint for or not self-publishing but a small imprint for literary fiction um and then he eventually i guess he i don't know if he saw my art first in the art world or whether he saw the game stuff but he eventually became interested in the game stuff and he was kept asking me like and so his press was called sator s-a-t-o-r press and that was putting out novels and he was like, hey, when is Maze of the Womb Medusa coming out? Because me and Patrick were talking about it. And I was like, it's not coming out from LTFP. Why don't you put it out? And he was like, okay. Um, uh, but basically he did what a lot of people started, started doing around 2015, 16, which is copying the LOTFP business model without realizing maybe that it was rare. Um, uh, the, the, the LOTF biz, business model at which we started was like totally did not exist, I don't think, which was 
we get a profit split and we try to sell lots of copies. Um, and the previous indie thing would be like, you get paid by the word and we sell less than a thousand copies um, and they're cheap. Whereas James is like, I'm gonna get people I think are really good. Otherwise I don't wanna put out the book and I'm gonna pay them lots of money and I'm not gonna make enough profit. Like he was very, like he did not, LOTFP did not make, started in like, I don't know, 2009 or 10 didn't turn a profit until Red and Pleasant Land for, mm -hmm. for James. So his creators were getting paid and he wasn't, um, which I don't think a lot of people, I mean, Kickstarter had changed things to some degree, but the, the thing that James made people expect from a book like Red and Pleasant Land is like not a thing that you can realistically do unless you, you have some like dials slided in weird places and so I think a lot of people were, oh we need a kickstarter this crazy thing but it's like yeah like you're not getting an artist to make you red and pleasant land art for free which is basically what I did. I'm, I'm my own artist right? right um you need a writer and then you know publishing it on that and then selling that many copies is you know if you're not relatively well-known but still indie you're not going to sell that many copies and so but the other people were like we want to do this we're going to make a, i can imagine a book like this but ours and it's like good that's cool but remember like the economics of the situation are actually tighter than you expect and i hope that everyone who dicked me over is now experiencing the horrible problem of the fact that they can't draw or that you know whatever else is going on but maybe they're not and whatever but kickstarter definitely helped it changed the game like uh that made it easier to make a high-end kind of book. And then the trick at that point is to make, to find talent, especially the artists, because there's a lot of writers. Like most GMs are a stone's throw away from being an art writer or a game designer. So like there's a bigger talent pool, but finding artists who can do that many pages and can do functional work, you know, not just like some cool splashes, but like do your dungeons, do your explanatory pictures, you can do your incidental art kind of who can do all those weird formats like that's a little bit harder um especially if you're paying them separately after the fact and you're not working them with them to create the book um right. so yeah we kind of invented that model and satter imitated it and did great um it sold a lot of copies it's still selling copies um and uh and then other people kind of followed along <coughs> all right so you were having lots of success at Lamentations. You had success with Maze of the Blue Medusa, and then you had the bad breakup and the accusations that came out, right? Yeah. So if you would, because I don't think, I don't think it's out there enough in your words, what happened and, you know, the facts behind it and, you know, how this led to you being canceled and not being published? Well, basically, I mean, the first thing is that Mandy is chronically ill. Um, she mm -hmm. had, you know, she has one of those things that will never get better. You know, there's no cure. Um, and she was just getting sicker and sicker. And, you know, she was in LA and we were porn actors. And like, so she was increasingly kind of separated from the people around her. Like we're, you know, they're going out doing things, having fun. And increasingly she's isolated, you know, um, by her illness and getting sicker. And that's not great. Um, for anybody's mental health. Um, and then on top of that, I've like, this kind of recently came to light because they're doing all these depositions and shit. There was a mutual friend we had who was like a dude um, and he was trying to sleep with her, which she's admitted. Um, and he said to her that I had cheated on her, like within the weird bounds of our polyamorous porn star relationship like I had still you know I deceived her in some way it wasn't true but he said it and she believed it and so I suspect she started looking for a just like looking at everything I did like super suspiciously you know so everything suddenly has a bad motive um and then on top of that just you know she believes it so she wants revenge so she has a she has a, a reason to believe things that are kind of edge cases are sinister and she has a reason to you know just openly lie if it'll hurt me so you know she gets madder and madder about all this and then you know we break up uh and then two years later she makes these accusations but she's also at by that point like cut off contact with everyone who was our friend like everyone that we knew together in LA who would have been like mm -hmm. I realized because she has um 
borderline personality disorder or something else. Like she was diagnosed borderline and she was treated as if she had it for 10 years and then she got a new diagnosis, but she's had some kind of mental illness for a very long time, like long before she met me, that the people around you tether you when you are mentally ill. You know, like they're the ones who go, hey, that thing that you just said doesn't match what you did on Thursday or whatever. And once she got, you know, she went back to live with her parents in Ottawa, she was kind of cut off from all the people who would have, who tethered her. And she had all decided they were all assholes anyway, which is what you do when you have borderline. It's like you, borderline personality is the borderline between a regular person and a psychotic person. It is like the, you know, it's a scary thing. Um, And so she had kind of untethered herself from the reality of her situation. She wasn't talking to anyone who really knew me or her when we were together and she kind of drifted into she also had a crazy again this came out in the deposition she has this crazy like hippie Jungian therapist aunt and the aunt had met me like a grand total of once right or twice uh, we talked for 15 minutes but you know so what aunt doesn't want her porn star daughter to not really be a porn star right so mm-hmm. she's having trouble with her relationship she goes and talks to her hippie Jungian therapist aunt and she's like well, you know, maybe you have repressed memories, you know, of, of secretly not wanting to be this person. And she's like, maybe I do. Repressed memories are bullshit. The satanic panic was based on repressed memories. Like they aren't a thing in, in, in the context here. It's made up like, but she had an out suddenly, basically by this point, she's now got to point. she's blaming her whole personality from, you know, 2007 until 2017 on me. She's like, I didn't want to be that person. I was a completely imagined, like, I just, she was brainwashed, apparently. Like, it's, now she says she wants to be a nun. Like, she's a porn star. He used to talk constantly about how much she liked porn and having sex and being a slut and there's no God and blah, blah, blah. And now she wants to be a nun. On paper, that doesn't strike, shouldn't strike anybody as like a super sane person. But, so yeah, I mean, she basically went nuts. Um, I feel like the most... The thing I think of most is I, we used to go to sleep, right? And I would turn my head and, you know, if you turn your head and you're sleeping next to someone, your nose goes up against their shoulder and you know, pig nose. So I would do that and I would go, wee wee, I'm a pig. And it'd be all dark in there. And she'd go, Zach, there's a pig in the bed. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mandy. You're crazy. There's no pig in the bed. And she'd be like, I heard a pig. And I go, wee wee, I'm a pig. I'm in the bed. And she's like, there's a pig in the bed. I heard it. I'm like, Mandy, just go to sleep. You're being nuts, right? And it was a bit and we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look literally at the documents, she's like, he would make animal noises in the night in an attempt to keep me awake and then gaslight me by claiming he had not made them. Like, that, like, I don't know what that's called, you know, but that's like a level of either a will to like just distort things to be like a monster or genuine delusion that it's not communicable to people who haven't been through it. Like you just like, she, she, she's nuts now. Um, It's upsetting. Uh, But yeah. um, So that happened. Um, And so she goes online and she writes her Facebook post. Um, And, you know, fake reports to the police about sexual assault are rare. Fake reports on Facebook about your ex are every day. Everyone does that all the time. There are no statistics right. saying that that's rare. People lie constantly. Like literally everyone on the internet has been accused of almost every crime there is after five years. Like, so she gets on Facebook, she does this. Um, and then in the RPG community, I had been a person who was like, the discussion is very shitty in the community in general. Like just discussions are bad if you don't fact check. You know, if you're not a person who like, you can't like, don't do this 4chan shit where you, where you call people names, like talk to them if you don't just like, basically like the way I would expect a more a professional group of colleagues to talk. I was like, it, everyone has to talk that way to each other until you have a reason not to. Like you have to be able to prove like this person did a shitty thing, you know, like, right. and I had made a lot of friends and a lot of enemies doing that for 10 years, especially because the OSR was dealing with 
OSR plus porn stars, like we're dealing with a lot of snobbery around us for a long time. And it was a community of creative people that you could actually affect. You know, like in the art world, I was selling paintings and making good money, but like, you know, there's no conversation in the art world about anything. You know, it's just like very rich people buy paintings and then nobody really, they talk about it, nothing matters. There's no controversies beyond like, oh, this person forged a painting. But in the, the, the RPG world is small enough, you can make an impact if you said, hey, we're not doing this anymore. And I felt like conversations were way better when you were like, yeah, this whole thing of like, you know, you're gonna edition war or you're gonna call people names, like just without talking to them, like we're not doing that. Like you're, I'm not letting you hang out with me if you're doing that. And this is, the, this is where the good conversation is. And that pissed so many people off. And over the years, everybody had at least one friend who didn't like me. And so Mandy says that, it's 2016, it's post me too. Rats leaving a sinking ship, basically, at that point. They're like, oh, I never liked him anyway. Um, and now I'm you know, filtering in, there's people who are kind of apologizing and they're like, yeah, I kind of did a thing. But I'm like, yeah, well, it doesn't matter if you email me, like get on social media where you were when this happened and go like, yeah, I fucked up. Um, but yeah. So, and then James, James, to his credit, did not go, all this shit is true. He just was like, yeah, I'm under so much pressure from basically uh, the distributors, you know, they're businessmen. They just don't want drama, right? So they don't want to hear about, they don't want to get a bunch of letters. So the distributors at DTRPG and other, and Gen Con and, uh, and other businesses associated with selling your RPG books were like, yeah we don't want to deal with anything new from this guy. And James was like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I was like, well, that's stupid and evil, but you know, at least you're not pretending that you think this is credible. Uh, and he's like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and that's James. Uh, he's comfortable with a very high level of, I don't know, which I don't think is like the most responsible thing in the world, but you know, he has to send me a check every, every quarter. So I'm not going to get in big fights with him. So are those like residuals from um, DTRPG that he has to send you stuff for? Because I know he's not carrying your books anymore, well, or is it? I don't think the DTRPG, they don't, they don't sell new Zach product, but all right. of the old stuff has other people besides me uh, on it. And so their ruling was like, we're not going to stop selling those books because Zach's not the only beneficiary. But basically I get royalties from all of, my books except death frost doom because that was sort of work for hire um so you know if you buy anything anywhere that's uh that's one of mine i get i get money so uh we have to we have a business relationship until people stop buying pdfs of vornheim and you know red and pleasant land and frost split and mutilate which they keep selling them um so we keep we keep in touch Right. Yeah. I noticed on uh, uh, drive through RPG, I mean, it's your books that are the highest sellers um, in PDF format for Lamentations. You know, it, it's those, those are the books that those are the, the top ones. So obviously there's still people out there who, who want to purchase these products. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely still people who want to buy them, but it's like, unless they talk about them, it shrinks, you know, and talking and they, there's a lot of people who are just afraid to talk about them, you know, like they're afraid they'll get pushed back or they don't know what to do. And um, the RPG community, just even just leaving me out of it has changed a lot in the last few years. Like it's become much more fragmented. It's harder mm -hmm. to get information. Um, there's fewer different wings of the, of the RPG universe talking to each other. So yeah, it's it's a little bit shitty in that way. I think in many ways, that's the way the whole world has gone. We're all so fractured now and not talking to each other and not demanding truth and facts anymore and proof of things. It's just, okay, oh, somebody said this. Okay, I'm going to believe this. I'm going to cancel. You know, I'm not going to buy anything from this person type of thing. Um, and that, that was one of the things that all that stood out about you, Zach, is that like you 
and Grim Jim were two people who didn't get along really well, but you stood up for him when the facts were in his favor, the truth was in his favor, even though you guys didn't get along. And I was wondering, like, is that just something the way you, you grew up or, that you were so dedicated to facts and truth and speaking things how they are and not letting personal relationships get in the way of that kind of thing? I mean, yeah. And I also think that now looking back, for me, the stakes were low. Why wouldn't you always be honest? You know, like at the time, like until February 10th, 2019, when my my wife went insane <coughs> there was no no real consequences to telling the truth that could possibly be bad you know it's like <coughs> oh you know like some story gamers mad at you like I'm still you know that has nothing to do with my real life you know what I mean like we're not losing money I don't know I don't know if we're losing money or gaining money it's annoying and shitty and it's preposterous, but <coughs> at the end of the day, it's usually words on a screen and very controllable and, and doesn't, my life wasn't that. I think for a lot of people, which I, looking back, I now see, they had nothing going on in their lives that was fun or creative for them, except their RPG thing. And so as small creators, everything was massively high stakes for them. And so they wouldn't speak out because they were, you know, you couldn't piss off Vincent Baker because he's in charge of story games and you're a story gamer, or you couldn't piss off, you know, fucking, you know, like Monty Cook because he's, a, you know, you are a graphic designer and he might hire you. And it was like, so for these people who like their whole life was trying to succeed in the RPG industry, they would simultaneously stay the fuck away from any controversial subject, even if they had a real obvious take that was like, yeah, this is obviously wrong. And then on the other hand, they would email me constantly and be like, thank you for saying that, you know? It was right. for me, it was like, yeah, like, I don't know. I've never been not, because as like, without me even trying, like D&D &D and Porn Stars was controversial just because we were who we were and we were playing old school D&D, &D, which apparently was utterly incendiary. Like <laughs> Porn Stars was one thing, but the fact that we were playing old D&D &D and we weren't playing like fucking whatever fucking dungeon world was like, pissed people off and they're like how how dare you have women play a game that's not a story game like you know and the girls were just like oh, give me a fucking axe and chainmail bikini and shut up you know and it was just that was like you guys live on another planet i don't know what's going on but that was there was never not controversy you know and so being like oh if i say this it'll piss people off like they're always all pissed off for stupid reasons like and you know also just like maybe i come from you know my upbringing but like and this is a little weird to me because I feel like there's a lot of people who theoretically come from this same place, but like, I don't come from a world where pissing people off is in itself a bad thing. You know, like the world is full of shitty people and they will get pissed off if you do cool things. And that's always been, almost everything I can think of falls into that category. It would never occur to me to just not upset people just for the sake of not upsetting them. It's like who you upset that's important, right? And so... Jim, I, I didn't really even know anything about him at the time. All I knew is that somebody literally said, yeah, a story game dude was like, yeah, I investigated this whole claim about him that he had threatened people with rape and it wasn't true. Nobody was contesting that. I was like, okay, it wasn't true. And then all these people were like, who had already kind of dogpiled on this guy were not apologizing. And I'm like, if this had happened in an office, everyone was looking at you like you had just like stolen somebody's birthday cake. Like the level of like dishonesty and evasion that was allowed just because, Oh, it's the internet. I know your name. I know what you make for a living. I know like you're a colleague and you're seriously just going to like do that and not apologize and not go, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Like, and then also the thing that really freaked me out about it was that they had escalated from him writing a distasteful essay that was kind of shitty to fake felony accusation. Like, right. like, like and that was the thing that really alarmed me is that like the community was so head up that they, they had so little control over their own selves that they would get mad about you writing an essay, which, you know, you can write a shitty essay, 
but they would then go, because I'm mad about that, I'm going to make a fake felony accusation. And I was like, that's wild. Nobody in this world, no, none of us like sitting around, like trying to like cut and paste together our little games should ever be in a situation that's that high stakes. You know, like that's like you argue all you want, but don't create that situation where someone's being accused like of something you could go to jail for just because you don't like they, they're tasteless or they're kind of, you know, like not in your, like, you know, you have a philosophical argument with them or like that just seemed like just on like unbelievably, obviously like grown up morality that nobody else was taking on. And that alarmed me and it turned out to be prophetic because all of those same people then did it again, like five years later, which actually has been helpful in court because I can be like, look, these people have a history of like fake accusations around sexual assault here are their names everybody's seen this happen here's all the records and the court's like oh my god what when grow i can't emphasize how much shrinks lawyers judges journalists when they look at this stuff they're like they don't react the way the rest of the rpg community does where they're like yeah well you were a jerk online they're like holy fuck what's wrong with these people like is this real and i'm like yeah this is not only real but it's like a relief to hear you say that because in the world where when I talk to them, everyone's like, acts like this is normal to be like, oh, well, they did one thing I don't like. Therefore, they are probably like a felon. Like it's it's really breathtaking. Like and there'll be like days where I'm like the the morning is some fucking bullshit goes on, happens on it on like online or Reddit somewhere. And I've got a screen cap all of it. And then the afternoon is I'm in court or talking to a lawyer and I'm suddenly in the real world. And they're like, yeah, this is this, that's that. This is, and I'm like, oh, so you understand what I'm saying? They're like, of course. Like, yeah, like that's defamation. That like, clearly I'm like, yeah, I know. Right. Like it's very weird going back and forth. It's like visiting like the Muppet show or something. Like, we're, 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 like what are you like? Is this the world you live in? Like you could just say like, it's like, do you not know that it's it's really weird um and it may have something to do with the fact that like i don't like this line of reasoning but it becomes increasingly feels like it's true which is like it's an escapist hobby largely for man children you know like there are a lot of people who are just they're not at home in the world and they are not at home with the world's standards of behavior and so they want to have this fantasy world that they work in and it genuinely is like they've created an online fantasy world where the standards of morality are like well if i like you then i can just say anything i like to you and you'll say anything to me and we'll just believe everything we say and that's how the world should work right and i was like in a song you know <laughs> like like you're in real life like how do you get anything done in this i don't know it's like a rant but yeah it's it's a weird thing so <clears throat> you brought up like in the courts where people are understanding what you're saying. Yeah. So um, I want to make sure that I've got this clear. Please <laughs> clarify. Um, so charges have never been brought against you from what I understand. Of oh, these hell no. That's the point of all this, right? Like mm -hmm. the whole point of doing this to someone is that you don't take the risks that someone who accuses, who calls the police and makes an accusation makes you know like that is a real risk and that is why you know the incidence of like fake reports of all crimes including sexual assault are very low because that's like you might end up in jail for fucking perjury and if you perjure yourself in a criminal case about a felony right no this is not that at all this is like and not even like in the art world nobody gives a shit you know like they do when they're told, you know, like they'll get a message like, oh, and then that's alarming, but they didn't carry the story. And in the porn world, they didn't carry the story. And in, you know, people who publish my books don't ask me questions like my, you know, my not RPG books. Like they didn't ask me any questions about this. It's like gamers alone took this and ran with it because of my history of pissing off the RPG community by trying to ask them to like tell the truth and not be dickheads. So yeah, it's, it has nothing to do with like, I'm not going to be in jail for this. And that would be a great defense, by the way. Like I'm suing people and like, if they would go like to the police, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Your video just, you know, freaked out for a second. But anyway, like if they would go to the police and be like, oh yeah, he did it. Then like that would actually help them in court because they could say, okay, it was a real crime. 
but right now they're trying to have to explain like oh yeah he's at this point like one of the worst criminals in human history like like apex level predator uh breaking world records and yet nobody thought out yeah, even now let's not lock him up like it none of it makes sense um but yeah no there's no criminal charges involved here the only criminal charge that might happen is like like if somebody perjures themselves hard enough to piss off a prosecutor then hopefully like you know this will probably never happen but like they will get prosecuted for perjury in a criminal situation but no i mean this is all civil litigation basically initiated by me because it's the only way to clear my name right and so i was going to ask you about that <clears throat> you have actually won cases against people who have made these accusations about that and i think there's a online there's a lot of people that don't even realize that, that one, you've never been charged with anything. And two, you've taken people to court over this and you've won. So could you well, I tell us about that? I successfully uh, like settled the case in, uh, in Australia, basically against Eden, who was like a massive troll and kind of a something. I don't know, for some reason, I'm like the only person who seems to be, who talks about something awful, except something awful members, but they're a whole bunch of game designers and they're really aggressive trolls and they go after everybody. Um, but Atten was like public enemy number one. He was a moderator there. He was also moderator at RPG net. And he would, he was like the most aggressive, shitty, dishonest person imaginable. And so, and he was also the person who like would collect all the shit, like anything, anything happened, like I stubbed my toe. And I read on Twitter from Atten, like Zach stubbed his toe. He doesn't know how to walk. Lol. Like, every day like something with him and so i was like this guy is definitely like a super spreader like he's one of the worst people and so i sued him in australia and like a, and again this is the guy who has all the supposed receipts like right he folded mm -hmm. like a fucking like immediately just like like yeah no here have money I'm, i apologize like whatever like the whole side of this which is not about my ex's accusation i mean he he said you know you're not an abuser and i said you were and that, that's wrong but in it, it, he could have had a defense of like, oh, I wasn't talking about Mandy. I was talking about, you know, your online offenses. He could have said that if he had any proof of those, but he doesn't because there aren't any. Like, and if Etten doesn't have them, they don't exist, you know? Like, and of course, right after it happened, he raised a bunch of money, like, because he was like, oh, I got sued and I'm sad. So it's not like he couldn't have raised money for his defense. You know, like anybody at that time, probably even now, who's like saying, oh, Zach is suing me online, could easily raise a bunch of money for his defense. So it's not like he didn't have money for his defense. It wasn't like, and Australia is not like some crazy country that has different, like has the same fucking laws as Canada, the UK, like it's half the fucking civilized world, uh, like in terms of, you know, he just, he is a dishonest troll who has been playing a role for so long that like he's convinced that that's what he should be doing. I don't know whether it's morally or just like, Hey, why not? I don't care about people who aren't like me, but he folded immediately. And anybody who even just says, Oh, you know, like Zach is, was, was a harasser online. Like they're also going to fold immediately. Like they don't have the paperwork and he, and anybody who says I was in real life has to then get Mandy to testify. And she doesn't want to testify for a bunch of people who were, harassing her for 10 years as well like she has no love for most of these people um and that has been a real weird irony like on the one hand she she kind of had to like throw me to the wolves on the other hand those were the same people who have said like rancid shit about her for 10 years and all her friends like her former friends are like still on team zach so it's like the ghost of mandy past still exists you know like in that's a complicated thing but yeah i mean basically he had to apologize um i sued mike merles because it was like he's obviously super important but with mike he f the judge rule basically like it was it was dismissed because he made a really on the line statement it was hard to tell it was about me he basically said he wrote a long you can go read it but he wrote a long thing about abusers do this abusers do that didn't say any names. And then the last sentence said, oh, and in other news, I hope Mandy does well or whatever. So it's pretty obvious, like even describing it now and to everyone who right. read it, that it was about me. But like the judge was like, it's hard to tell what he's saying about you specifically and or whatever. 
and that was an education I knew it was I knew it was a chance that it might not work and I was like all right I, you know that's I'm not gonna go crazy about, about that but yeah and everything else is kind of still in flux like it's still going on but uh they mandy and has raised like a motion to dismiss the case and used a lot of the dumb bad faith arguments that people use online like the fact that you're suing people means you're an abuser and, and the judge is like no dipshit like this is what you're <laughs> the judge literally like i was watch i watched it all because you do everything on zoom now so i was watching mm -hmm. and like mandy's lawyer who's like this like sweating like better call saul guy um he's like mm -hmm. He's like, well, you know, Zach has, you know, threatened to sue other people who, you know, said these things and, and that's a form of abuse. And the, and the judge said, that is what you're supposed to do. If someone says something that you believe is defamation, you tell them to take it down. You're supposed to. And then if they don't, you sue them. That's the legal remedy. Anything else is vigilantism. Like that, like, don't even make that argument in my court. So, but that I'll have, like her motion just to, um, this is kind of in legal weeds, but her motion to get the whole case dismissed failed, but she did it during COVID. So it took over a year to deal with that one motion. So I'm sitting here just like spinning my wheels waiting for, you know, justice to happen. But I'm not worried about the quality of the cases. I'm worried about just like its end, like it's so slow. That was why I sued her in, in Canada is because I was told it'd be faster, which wasn't true. Like if you can imagine like Los Angeles, probably sounds like a place where there's a lot of defamation suits because there's like a lot of famous people and it's a big city right. and a lot of money um and so i was like oh well in ottawa there's less and she lives in ottawa so this will all be over faster if i sue her there um but no it's just ottawa is a smaller system and who the fuck else knows but it's slow um so oh well so people who realize what's going on and everything how how can they support you at this point how can they purchase your stuff and how is there a chance of your stuff getting published and seeing the rest of this cube world especially for the people who i mean there's a lot of people out there who don't like to use pdfs they prefer the books you know they like to have something physical at the table um so let, let people know, how do you get the PDFs and how is a way forward for you to be uncanceled enough where you can actually publish hardcover books like, once again? Uh, basically, if you just want PDFs, which you know I put over like, I tried to make a compilation once just for myself and it was like over 400 pages. I'm like, I'm stopping. Like, so since, you know, I put out a lot of fucking material um, because I'm just basically taking my notebooks and just scanning them, you know, and then like, so these are the things I use at home. But um, like you basically just go to my blog, D and D with porn stars with an N, um, and then there's a on the web version there you hit the store uh, on the upper right and you just click it, um, or you just Google the store on D and D with porn stars, and there's like this list of everything that is there. Um, so if you just want stuff, that's where you go. Um, but in terms of like when will there be actual books? There'll be actual books when people decancel me. Uh, essentially. Mandy and a bunch of like really shitty internet trolls who are like well known aside did not do this. What the people who did this was like, you know, dozens and dozens of people who upvoted and agreed and shared anonymous people who did anonymous things to make this seem like a tidal wave. And there was a whole bunch of other anonymous people who were shit scared to push back. You know, they knew that and they write to me and they're like, I know this is, this sounds at least suspicious to me, but I don't want to be the person who's saying these things aren't, you know, they're scared. And like, basically people have to be as zealous in undoing this as they were in, as the other people were in doing it. Um, like you have to, like, I have to be in a place where I can be like, like I can meet someone in any context in my life and they go hey what's your name what do you do and i'm like i'm zach i'm a painter and they go oh, cool and they look at my paintings and then they google me and on the first page of the google results there's nothing about this shit because it's not true like you have to push back which means you got to go on you have to basically for most people that means you go to places on the internet you don't like full of people who you don't want to hang out with and ask questions that are you know annoying to ask and bring up points that, you know, I mean, an easier thing is just review, like if you get something that you like, review it, 
you know, and put it up, you know, so that's easier, but, and that's so definitely support, but like people have to take action, you know, like otherwise uh, nothing happens. Even if I win in court, you know, unless fans are like, yeah, this means something, then it stays the same and there isn't going to be any other published things. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, Um, so people also, as you can see, uh, I've got a Red and Pleasant Land shirt on, can get uh, prints of your artwork and yeah. uh, um, shirts that have art from your your non-RPG books, as well as Red and Pleasant Land, um, Maze of the Blue Medusa. You want to tell people how they can, can find that stuff? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a site called One Word Fine Art America. Uh, which is also, I think, the same site as pixels.com at this point. And basically, I sell prints and other stuff based on my art there. So you can, if you just want that picture, or I have a shower curtain that has one of the paintings on it, which is nice. Um, pillow, the throw pillars, pillows are pretty great. Um, but yeah, like they basically just will print. I have like 30 artworks on there and they'll just print it on whatever. So they have a whole bunch of you know, coffee cup or shirt or whatever. <coughs> Any chance of getting the actual picture of the blue Medusa on there? That was one that wasn't on there. I, I realized. I mean, my usual rule for that stuff is if you can get 10 people to all say they want the same picture, then I'll upload it and put it on there. Uh, otherwise, like just doing it for one person is like, that's like an afternoon's work. And I got right. something off that's already on there. Ah, um, I gotcha. Which is a little bit annoying. Um, so, but yeah, if you can get 10 people to be like, we all want, some this then i will do it and in general though a huge part of all of this shit is building networks of people who are all um invested in a better situation for creators you know like right now there's uh, people are sort of really scattered at this point like even like uh, you know, the story gamers, the people who came out of the forge were a really solid block of people. And then the whole thing with Adam Coble happened and then Luke Crane supporting him. And that kind of like kind of shot through that community. And then the guy, a PH Lee, who used to be known by another name, like he got canceled. And it was like, so kind of like that kind of damaged those, the coherence of those communities. And then what happened to me to obviously damage the coherence of the OSR community. Um, and then the other people coming up like the something awful people kind of they all they were never real nice people to begin with and they all kind of were at each other's throats after a while because they're very aggressive and you know. but basically like this sort of frenzy of cancellations that has happened over the past two years not just me but other people has kind of left it so there's this sort of there's no large voting block anymore of gamers who all will do a thing, you know? And the way that this happened was that these blocks of people would share the same kinds of information. They had the same concerns. And so the best thing you can do really is find another screen name of another person who seems to care about the same shit as you and talk to them and, and like, you know, be like, what, you know, what is a, what's a thing that's interesting to buy? What, what's a way to be supportive? What's, what's a, a safe or, you know, like, where do you go? Like, that's actually more important than all this other shit, because that's what leads to the other stuff is having networks of people who talk to each other. <clears throat> and so at this point, as far as like hardcover stuff is yeah. base of the blue Medusa, the only thing that you would be getting residuals from at this point, or you still get some from any of the other things um, from lamentations until they I mean, whatever they sell, whatever limitation sells that's mine, I get some of it, but I don't know if there's print copies of, of, of uh, Bornheim or Red and Pleasant or, I don't know. I mean, I think there are some, but I don't know. Um, but anyway, I get, I get money from them periodically for whatever it is that they sell, but those will be out eventually. And Medusa is the same way. Um, so if you buy them, uh, it, it, it helps, uh, you know. Right. Well, 
we have gone over a lot of stuff today over the last hour. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to let people know who, who might be interested either in you, the artist, you, the RPG designer, uh, um, you, the person who's being accused of things, anything you'd like else you'd like to add? I mean, the, the main thing is just ask questions. Like I have a blog, I, you know, D and D with porn stars blogs dot, but, Dot com I'm there like I read all the comments so like show up and just ask a question or you know involve yourself in some way and you'll get a response you know uh it's not hard like I don't like I made a decision 10 years ago not to be like an inaccessible game you know like a person who's you know like I didn't want to be like Monty Cook or like you know somebody who like oh if you got a response you're amazed you know like I wanted to be like Oh yeah, you know, like you need help with something, I'll help you. This was a terrible decision, probably the worst decision of my life. I should have like been really removed from the community and not talked to any of those people at all, but in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, so, you know, just uh, if you just communicate, you know, that's that's the easiest way to, to get anything that you want out of me or anybody else, you know, just, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in, you know, like, oh, yeah, I wish this project was finished. You know, I wish I'd like to see what this is. I can't, you know, if you're, I'm confused about where to start, like, you know, uh, I'm there, you know, so talk. All right. Well, <coughs> thank you so much, Zach, for spending the last, last hour with me. Let me ask you all these questions. I really do appreciate it and uh, okay. learned a lot. And hopefully uh, people that I share this with will learn a lot as well. Cool. Thank you so much, Nick. All right. You're welcome. You have a good day now, Zach. You too. See you later.